Hello everyone, it's Live at Five Mondays on Facebook with Cheryl Millett. It is New Year's Eve, so I just want to wish everybody a Happy New Year's Eve and also a Happy New Year because it will be next year when we finally pick back up for the Live at Five and I just wanted to make sure that I get that out there. Happy New Year. And we have, you know, a new year. And what does that mean? So a number of people make New Year's resolutions at this time. And it is something that's quite common, New Year's resolutions. And, and for everybody, it might mean, I mean, for a lot of people, it's about health. Uh, it's about taking action on things that they've wanted to take action on for, for some time. It could be health. It could be hobbies. It could be work-related, school-related, travel-related. It could be in that famous bucket list that they, you know, more and more people talk about today. Hi, everyone. And that is, you know, that is the truth of the matter. What I wanted to mention is if you have a number of things that you want to do, it would be very, very helpful if you actually wrote down in writing, handwriting, not typing, that you want what you want to do what's your intention what is it that you are looking to achieve and if one could step into taking smaller steps uh, let's say you know for thinking about eating and digest you know digesting while well, you're going to take bite-sized pieces and setting your intentions for the new year can be looked at as bite-sized pieces you know what can you when you when you have your list of things you know, what can you actually do, you know, this month? So take the five or ten things and go, okay, I'm going to do this one thing this month and make sure it's doable. Even if you go part way, instead of saying, uh, I want to work out five times a week, what about just once a week? Even just for the first week and then twice a week. And that's New Year's. New Year's resolution will be, you know, it's, it's in your control to be able to do those things. That's always something to remember. It's in your control to do those things. Well, let's get to health things because there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up and some of the work that I've been uh, studying, uh, somewhat to do with the gut, but you know, primarily it's looking at what things have been said in various books. And here's a book, it's called uh, Gulp by Mary Roach and was recommended by my husband's cousin. Um, but I just wanted to say really um, in here, what it talks about, and it's something I've mentioned before, is that companies are trying to work with what people want. And in this case, this is to do with pet food. And they talk about horse meat, especially with the automobile. It makes complete sense. You know, the automobile came onto the scene and more and more people were, were purchasing automobiles. The horses, what were they going to do with the horses? So there actually, a lot of the earlier pet food was actually horse meat. Then, um, that was canning them. And then with the wars, they weren't doing the cans. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't allocated. The metals weren't allocated to can tins and stuff like that. They were all allocated to the war. So there wasn't any canned horse meat that uh, was happening. So what they were trying to work with is uh, cheaper, which in that case, in that around that time, was probably a good thing. But the horse meat went by the wayside, and what happened is grains and soy, and that came in, and that's just cheap. And they know that that food is not for, let's just say, even the cats. Cats is either they either eat mice or they either eat birds. Those two things, but they're nowhere near grains. So the earlier food was actually coated with dye. Now this is one of the things that you know were very visual. So they were actually coating the pet food with dye, uh, red dye, whatever dye. And this food was actually being thrown up by the animals, as we know, cats and dogs. They might eat too much dogs in the way and they might throw up. Well, that wasn't good for the carpets, good for the floors. So that was a very bad idea. 
and they stopped doing that. But still today, they're using a lot of the cheap grains in the food. And what I learned in the book that I was just reading, Gulp, was that they actually coat the food with some sort of um, a palliative flavor, like a liver and organs. And they talk very much about the organs being the best part, you know, the best part, the most nutritious part. And of course, they were using this as to like coat the food. Now, that brings me to telling you about brown sugar and white sugar, because quite often people will say that brown sugar is much healthier, much more healthier. Now, we do have a variety of sugars now, some that are uh, just, you know, organic sugar cane, and we do. But just the typical sugar granules that we will get in bags and stuff, that's just coated with a bit of molasses. So having had, you know, a sugar refinery tour and asking about what's the difference between white and brown sugar, they said, mm, yeah, in a, in a big vat, you know, about this much molasses sugar. So what happens is they make the granulars of sugar, whatever size they want, and they put in little molasses. And as it's being whipped around in a centrifugal machine, it's being coated with the brown sugar. Now, we might think that it's going all the way through. It's just the sugar. It's brown sugar, and then it's being crystallized, but that's not the case. And the only reason why I kind of bring this all up is because, yes, in conversing, um, reading and conversing with people, there is what we think exists, but there is, there is that that's actually happening. And that might have to do with what the client, and the client is not necessarily the pet owner's but the pet food makers who want to make it cheaper, to make it more affordable or whatever it is, maybe on their budget for whatever reason, they do that. And so that's what I want to talk about there. The other thing I wanted to go into, and hello, more and more people, uh, I wanted to actually talk about something that came to my awareness around uh, let's call it fermented oils. Now, some of you might be for, uh, very familiar with cod liver oil. And then cod liver oil in the early studies that I did, probably at the eight, nine, ten years ago, to do with Weston Price, they talked more about the fish oils. Now, the fish oils were what they needed to do was to do it immediately so it wouldn't go rancid. So the best oil was actually taking the livers and producing an oil right away. So this was science to them as far as oxidation goes. And therefore, it would be a light-looking, tasting oil. And from that, there were uh, other companies that were making oils, but they were a bit darker, a bit stinkier, and so forth. But they did know that, uh, that the oil was... Uh, much healthier for us and the reason being is oxidation is not something though oxygen is very very valuable for us we all know that but it's almost like if you have to look at two things right there's the um, you know there's the good and the bad or the right or the wrong or the duality those kind of things and so oxidation uh, will be very helpful in nature as we think about breaking down nature, breaking down foods when composting, breaking down metals. So oxidation is not necessarily a bad thing at all. And of course, oxidating our cells and the oxygen is going to be very, very good. But when you have a food that in its wholesome and vibrancy, um, a food that way, then we want to consume it sooner. So this is what I wanted to bring up was actually there's something else that came into play. It's a fermented cod liver oil. And this fermented cod liver oil, if some of you are aware of it, was touted as being the best thing. And Weston A. Price is still tooting that. And I was trying to pull in all my science and and you know logic into that thinking you know oxidation of oils is never a good thing to ferment an oil 
would be oxidated oil, and that's not a good thing. But ferment in, in the way of sugar and grapes and wine and stuff like that. Not saying that alcohol is you know very good for us, but it didn't make any logical sense that we'd want to have that. And when I asked friends who tasted, I've never tasted it. They said it was god awful. Okay, well that's a second thing. Unless it's like bitters, if we're thinking about Chinese meds or something like that, that's a signal right there when it comes to oils when it tastes so bad and so rancid. First is the smell. You can always tell from oils. I talked about the testing olive oils to see if it's a really good olive oil and, and it was the smell, not the taste. But if something's tasting really bad, before you, you know, smell it and it smells kind of good but I mean if you put it in your mouth before you get a good whiff of it that should tell you too that it's oxidized but, but back to the fermented cod liver oil was there is some reading that I've done over the past few years since that kind of broke that that really the fermented oil was actually oxidized oil really shouldn't be consumed and I have no idea if some of this is actually uh, corresponding. Uh, David Gumpert, who, uh, who I've known for a few years, and he writes about it. He keeps me informed on it. But there were several other people that, at the breaking news of science and research and tests and labs, was showing that it wasn't that great. But he, he goes on into an article and talks about that, that there's a number of people that were die-hard fermented cod liver oil users uh, were actually have actually been taking uh, sick and cancer and I think one's a particular uh, brain cancer now nobody's saying that there's a hundred percent correlation here but here you have it you have the Weston A. Price crowd of people who are part of that and know a lot about health a lot about health broths and so forth and they're coming down not when they're 70 80 years old we're talking 40s and 50s and things like that but there's a lot more information here what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this link down below so you can read through it yourself um, I, I mean we can all feel that any death is it's not a good situation and as, as far as there's always friends and family involved um, we can talk about we can talk about how uh, you know how compassion comes in there uh, but the idea is to uh, to learn from these things, perhaps talk about them. And if it's education and it's helpful for a number of people, then great. But even coming to the standpoint where I saw with even raw food is, is that if it's not healthy for us, you know, let's all feel that here we can uh, change our mind. We can think about what's not working for us and uh, there's no shame or pride in a lot of ways that we have to hold on to enough that it's going to affect our health. We can absolutely change our mind if we think that uh, we've learned enough about things that we feel that that's what we want to do, if that's what we want to move into. I mean, great, that happened a lot in the raw food world where they started consuming some raw goat's milk or some raw eggs. And um, yeah, I'm going to say don't be embarrassed, you know, don't be embarrassed about various things. I tend to sit back and like to uh, see what people do with things, um, do my research, but you know, whole foods, foods grown naturally, animals grown naturally, as close as vibrant as possible. Um, but I, we also know that our mind is very, uh, an important piece of our health, the mind is. And that is completely related to when we think of stress, right? The big word stress, which is primarily a physics word, but we use it more often now. But when we have certain things and tension and, uh, you know, a lot on our plate or, you know, we're not feeling well or pain, um, relationship, community, all those things kind of can you know, make us start to think about how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about things. And that's important to our health. Very, very, very important to our health. The other thing I wanted to bring up um, is the uh, the flu shot. And I might have mentioned this already, but there, uh, there was also another case recently where a gentleman in New York 
uh, a young guy uh, actually, and I'll post the link as well, um, took sick from the flu shot and ended up dying. Again, death, not something we want to hear about, not something we want to kind of go in and start, you know, bashing something. You know, it's a very delicate time, I think, for people to hear that, and especially their friends and family. Uh, the idea is now I've been asking people more and more about the flu shot and discovering that the many people that are getting the flu shot are feeling terrible for not a week, not a day. I think the incredible Hulk, Lou, he got a flu shot and his arm swelled up so big he went into the hospital. But it looked like from the article he went into the hospital because he didn't understand it, but he also had to be part of some sort of a ceremony or something, and he wanted really to get this looked after and get this to come down. But the idea that I want to put out there is the flu shot might not be the same as the flu shot that used to be. Somebody mentioned something about it having changed. And I haven't read about it, so I don't really want to say too much about it. But if, if that is true, and that's what's causing more of the people to have these, um, you know, getting sick from the flu shot, and again, not one week, not even two weeks, um, three weeks later, still sick, then maybe we should think about it. And I still want to always interject here that our immune system, if we can build it naturally, make it strong naturally, then that's what we want to do. And maybe there's both sides. Maybe you get your flu shot, but you're actually building your immune system. If, that, if that's what's most comfortable. That might be for some people the way to go if they're elderly. But I think that's definitely the position that can be taken is actually to strengthen our immune system. But here's the thing. The immune system relies on the nervous system. So if everything is connected in our body, to have a lot of stress, which plays a role in what our nervous system is going through, and then that determines the hormones, you know, the cortisol, you can see how that's related, and then the digestive system doesn't work as well. Then we also want to understand that supporting our nervous system just is not just healthy fats, that is very, very important for the, for the nervous system, but also to put some relaxation, uh, some meditation, and at the least, some good breathing to actually and then to feel calmer and that would be very very important for the nervous system which is going to help the immune system so when we think of the immune system we do hear a lot about you know antioxidants and we hear a lot about that but think about the nervous system as well and what you can do to have less tension in the body what i was teaching the walk club because uh, sundays is the forest hill walk club in the last year, I just bring it up here and there, is that when we have a fall or when we have a trauma, now obviously if you break your bone or something like that, certain things, you know, you're going to take a trip to the hospital. But just on a note where we don't feel like we're going to the hospital, we have the thing, is actually to shake it off. So if you can imagine when you fall down and you trip, and what's happening in the body is actually everything is tensing up, right? You're just tensing. And that might be helpful for the fall, but I remember learning in skiing is just relax your body and you won't be as sore. So you can see how all the tie-ins here. Now, if you can relax your body when you're falling, great. If you can fall, learning in martial arts, we kind of learn to fall. If you can learn to fall in a, in a way, that's helpful too. Grab onto something. But a lot of the time, there's some tension there and that tightening that happens. And it might be because you're going to a party you don't want to go. And all of a sudden, you can feel yourself tightening and tightening because you don't want to do it. Maybe there's something there you don't want to do, uh, somebody there you don't want to talk to, but whatever it is, is this tightening. And so I want to kind of give you the idea that there's tightening happening here. And when that tightening's happening, if you're aware of it, you can, ha, you can loosen it. But if you can shake it, even better, especially if you kind of have a fall. So that's, that's really all I wanted to talk about today. 
was that our food might not be what you think it is because they're coating it with chemicals, uh, flavoring, I think it was International Flavors, was a company when I worked for food processing. Huge, multi-million, billion dollar industry flavors. And what they're doing is coating our food, our convenience food. Um, I think there was an example of Cheetos, you know, so some of the snack food. If you were to taste it without the coating that's there, it would taste like sawdust. Like it would taste like nothing, which is why when you chew these convenience food, even as I was talking about the gums, the flavor goes away. You don't have the natural flavor there as you would if you were chewing whole foods. So that's something to remember there. So our food might not be what you think it is. And yes, still up, absolutely organic, whole foods, um, some raw foods, but then we get into always chewing, right? Chewing our food properly. I wanted to, yes, bring up the fermented uh, cod liver oil, but most importantly, fermented or rancid oils as well. So rancid oils are going to be not good for your body. End of story. You do not want to do rancid oils. The other thing was the flu shot. So consider looking up what the flu shot contains. Ask about what the flu shot contains. If you're getting the flu shot, you should know what you're putting into your body. Um, and then also New Year's resolutions too as well. Uh, you want to have an accountability partner. That's what I'm going to do this year. Uh, some of the changes that I want to do, I want to get back into stair climbing. I want to get back into a few things. So I'm going to do that. And feel free to put your, I guess your one, two, or three things that you want to do in the next week or so down below, live or five, if you want the whole group here to be you know, accountability that way, feel free. Or find somebody that you can have, just have a accountability call five to 10 minutes uh, a week. You pick the date for each other, and that's kind of important there. Anyway, that's what I wanted to kind of speak about today. And I want to wish everybody the best of health in 2019. Definitely, I encourage or motivate to have at least one if not two, if not three, healthy things that you want to kind of bring in throughout the year, whether they're not right away, but somewhere, uh, somewhere in there. Um, I can think of chewing and drinking enough water as two very important things. If that's something that you're not doing well already, which is enough water and the chewing, and of course it takes practice. But Happy New Year, everyone. I hope uh, you have a wonderful evening, whether that be a quiet, cozy evening by yourself reading a good book and or going out with some friends. Um, you know, we're going to have a dinner here, not here, but at a neighbor's, uh, or doing a whole whoopla of champagne and big parties as they have them. So no matter how you're celebrating your New Year's Eve, and John and Renee and Arnie and Tracy and Debbie and Robin, however you are celebrating your New Year's Eve, know that we are together. We're a community. No one needs to feel alone. I'm going to wish you a happy, happy New Year, the best of health in the New Year and beyond, and take care. Until next Monday, have a wonderful week. Bye for now.